just saying that you'll get three minutes. I'm now going to, going to say you'll get five minutes to do an introduction and opening statement. Please tell us a little about yourselves, where you were born, your education and work experience, why you are running, and where you live. Shani, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, hi, y'all. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And I just threw out that, y'all, because I don't often admit I was actually born in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, but I only lived there very briefly because my dad uh, was in the Army and used the ROTC program to then attend Western Washington University. And so at a very young age of about one and a half, I moved to Bellingham, Washington, and that is where I was raised. My, I received, uh, I went through public schools in Bellingham, uh, received my bachelor's degree from Western Washington University, and then I've lived in uh, Washington, D.C. for about five years, in Austin, Texas for a couple of years, and then approximately 21 years ago, moved back to the Northwest and back to Seattle. I lived for one year in Belltown, and then I got pregnant with my first child, and at eight months pregnant, moved to West Seattle. So I have been in West Seattle for about 19 years, and I live near uh, West Seattle High School and Madison Middle School in that neighborhood there, um, and it's been a wonderful community that I've been very proud to be involved in. I've been, I was active, I worked part-time on and off for about 10 years while I was the primary caregiver for my kids, and so during that time, I was an active volunteer with the West Seattle Food Bank, with the 34th District Democrats, volunteered at the White Center Food Bank with the 34th District Democrats, and I am currently active with Westside Baby, serve on their board, and I hope folks here are familiar with them, an organization at White Center that <laughs> provides diapers and safety equipment for families in need. So, and also very active on my kids' uh, PTA and lobbying and Olympia on education issues. So that's sort of my background on a lot of the community side of things. And then what people often hear me talk about is indeed my three kids, because they are what really motivates me and inspires me to run. So. My daughter, Caitlin, is 11. She was adopted from Korea, and so this last year, she came home from school upset because kids at school were talking about kids being sent home to the countries in which they were born, and she was worried that that was gonna happen to her and that I was not going to be with her when that happened. Obviously, she was talking about the divisive immigrant and refugee issues that we're seeing from our federal government, and I was able to have a serious conversation with her about why for her, that wasn't something she had to worry about, but I also had to share with her that for many families, it is. And it's a real thing, and we had to start talking about what do we do as a community, what happens uh, in our governments to help to prevent that, how does this state stand up in different ways and our community stand up in different ways. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son who's now a freshman in high school, and I've been telling the story about how infuriating it was to have him have his most interesting thing that happened in school that day around the dinner table be that he spent the day figuring out how to hide or escape if an active shooter came to school. No one wants to hear that, certainly no parent, and I don't think anybody in the community wants to hear that, and that's not what we want our teachers or our students to be focused on. So I think uh, gun responsibility is a huge issue that the legislature has failed us on, frankly, and we have got to step forward and start addressing issues of gun responsibility. I'm a supporter of Initiative 1639 that is on the ballot, uh, and I look forward to implementing that, presuming that it will pass, and if it does not, I would certainly lead at the Senate and sponsor bills to be sure each portion of that uh, is moved forward in the state Senate and at the legislature. Uh, and then I, my oldest son is 19, or is 19 now. He came out when he was 16. He is gay. We have seen what is happening with our LGBTQ communities, an assault from our federal government, sometimes assaults from people within our state and within our legislature. I will stand up. I have always been an ally and an advocate. I am now a mama bear ally and advocate, and we all know that means serious business. So um, I look forward to fighting for the civil rights for all of our communities should I be elected to the state senate. I have professional experience in public service working at King County. I currently work for Dow Constantine, the county executive. I've worked for him for about two years. Prior to that, I was chief of staff for Joe McDermott at the county council for about six years. So I have experience in a technically nonpartisan, but really a bipartisan setting. There are Republicans and Democrats who serve on that council. So I have experience moving legislation through a bipartisan body, and I would like to bring that experience and that perspective to work on behalf of all of you here in the State Senate. So thanks for being here tonight. Really appreciate 
seeing this. It's democracy in action. It's a big deal to have people show up and to have these conversations. So thank you so much. born and raised here. So my parents were refugees from Vietnam. Uh, my dad fought with the U.S. Navy uh, in Vietnam and evac'd out with the first wave of the military. My mom actually came about three years later. She was on one of the first waves of the boat people. So uh, for three years, she actually didn't know where he was because when he was evac'd out, they didn't have text messaging or email and whatnot. So she didn't know if he was dead or alive. The only way that she found out was that he was sending letters from Seattle to Japan and Japan to Vietnam. And they happen to live in a fishing village, and that's how they escaped Vietnam. So on our campaign page, you'll see a photo of a, of a boat with my family on it, and that's them. The reason why we're in White Center is because we had access to public housing. So down the street, there's Seola Gardens. Uh, do folks know where Seola Gardens? I'm sure they do. It used to be called Park Lake Homes. That's actually where I was born. So I was born in that area. My cousins were all here. All my family and friends were here as well. Uh, a little while later, we moved down to Burien, uh, off of 128th, so Mary's Place is just here, nearby where the Milan Clinic was, uh, and now the Mary's Place. So, born here, raised in Burien. I actually live in West Seattle now with my family. I have two young kids, uh, three and one, uh, when they are amazing uh, when they sleep. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes, they don't. So, uh, the reason why I'm running for office also is when I was in Burien, my family and I, uh, experienced a healthcare crisis. So my father was actually in a car accident when I was younger uh, that rendered him quadriplegic. So we were already uh, immigrant family. My mom was working, you know, uh, multiple jobs, and my father's in a car accident that left him quadriplegic. Uh, that healthcare crisis really crippled us financially. It was very tough for us uh, growing up. And through that experience, uh, we saw firsthand what happened when you don't have access to quality care. And that's why I care about healthcare for all so bad. I don't want anybody to have to go through the same experience as we did. Uh, and the reason why we're fighting so hard and the reason why I'm running for office here and only here in this district is because uh, my father is quadriplegic. My brother and I would have to carry him up and down the stairs because we didn't have a ramp at our house. We couldn't afford to build one for years. Uh, one of our neighbors was driving by one day and happened to see it. Uh, him and his buddies the next weekend came and they built us a ramp so we didn't have to carry my dad up and down the stairs. So in our greatest time of need, uh, in our time where we had to go to the food bank to get food, uh, we, if not for the Salvation Army down uh, in White Center, we wouldn't have had Christmas presents during Christmas. This community, the one that we're in right now, came out for us. So if I'm in a place where I'm able to give back and serve, uh, to me that's an obligation and that's why I'm running for state senate is to be that person that can give back to the community that give, gave me so much. Uh, to give you a little more background on the stuff that I've done as well, so I volunteer in an organization called Wellspring Family Services. It's one of the oldest nonprofits in Washington State. It's 125 years old. They do a lot of work with family homelessness. So a lot of the work that uh, Mary's Place talked about, diversion, uh, addressing issues of domestic violence and whatnot, that's what we've been working on for the past few years. We've uh, helped keep folks out of homelessness or get folks out of homelessness. I also work a lot with community relations. Uh, there was a young man last year named Tommy Lay who was shot uh, in Burien. And after that, uh, I really wanted to partner with the community and with law enforcement to figure out a solution to hopefully honor uh, what happened there, but also make sure that doesn't happen again. So I serve on the Commission for Law Enforcement Oversight. Uh, I also do a little bit of work with the Washington Low Income Housing Association as well. I spoke at their conference a few months ago uh, to talk about advocacy and how you can pass legislation to help folks. Uh, in fact, this past year uh, with Wall Street Family Services, we passed our first bill that supported uh, young uh, children who experienced trauma. So one of our goals is to systemically fix issues associated with trauma to help get folks out of it uh, as well. So professionally, I actually work at Microsoft. So my background is in strategy and technology, uh, but the team that I'm specifically on actually does job training resources. So what we try to do is we build uh, training so that folks who are interested in the technology field uh, who otherwise would have had access based off of their education and whatnot, are able to take the courses for free and then get the job, tra job training they need to actually become part of that community as well. So the biggest thing for me is, is, is serving in this community and making sure that the folks here have the opportunity to thrive, uh, much like I did 
Uh, we experienced a lot of trauma uh, growing up, but at the same time, I'm very privileged to be part of this community my entire life. I uh, went to school uh, in Hazel Valley on the Menory. I heard somebody said that they had went to Hazel Valley. I went to Cascade Middle School as well. I uh, ended up going to Kennedy because Evergreen Redistrict. That wasn't my fault. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would have fixed that if I, was, if I knew him at that time. And then I went to Sandy University as well. So born and raised in this area, the people here are my family and friends, and we'll fight for them uh, because I, I feel obligated and indebted to this community that's given me so much. So thank you so much for, for coming up for coming as well. No, this is not an accident. I totally agree. So if you look at this checklist, 
less than 200% of the federal poverty level, foreign born, non English speaking, less than high school degree, less than college degree, all of those are checked by my family. So my family uh, is certainly part of this, and I, we all still live in the area actually. So the house where I grew up, my uncles now live there as well. My aunts live down the street as well. So. Uh, this is a reality, this is a lived experience that I faced growing up, and this is certainly something that I've noticed. And this is actually one of the reasons why we're running for office, is because I've noticed this my entire life. And I wanted to make sure that the representation that we have at all levels of government reflect the entire 34th district as well. Uh, obviously, uh, other parts need services and help as well, but there are certain parts that uh, have been neglected for far too long. Uh, myself being included as part of that as well, and that's why I care so passionately about running for this seat. I don't know if there was an actual question. I think the question was, do you agree? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and do you think it's by accident? No, I don't think it's an accident. I also don't think that it's an accident that half of Berrien and half of White Center are in the 34th, but then all of West Seattle and all of Vashon are in it as well. So it's a very interesting dynamic when you have such a unique district in the 34th, yet the, the areas that need representation the most are the ones that are also most diluted. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that the end? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, <laughs> not to, I didn't want to cut you off. No, you're good. Thank you, Liz. Uh, yes, absolutely. And no, I don't think it's by accident. Everything has demonstrated the history, the zoning history that we have had, the history of where our resources go, how we manage it from a public policy perspective. I don't believe it is an accident. Um, and we absolutely need to start addressing it now. You referred to equity and social justice, which is an office that we have in King County that we work to use an equity and social justice lens on every piece of policy that passes now. It's still, you know, we're still doing work there. There's always still more to do, but that is the kind of lens I believe we need to bring to our state government as well so that when we are making policies and making decisions on behalf of the state and on behalf of this district, we are looking at things through an equity lens and we are actually measuring that and talking about that and talking about what the impacts and outcomes are and that we're going back and looking at it to see if those are things that we can still achieve. I really got engaged, frankly, in um, sort of advocating on behalf of education because it became so clear that people like my dear friend who is a single mom and had a child and could not own her own business, runs her own business, but could not afford daycare, depended on her parents to provide childcare, was put, put in a situation where her son, when he started middle or started kindergarten, had not had any what I'll call sort of formal socializing within our traditional education structure. And that was all because of the place where he was born and the situation that his mother was in economically. We are failing if we do not give all of our children an equal opportunity to thrive when they are walking into our public school systems. And to address that, we have got to address it sooner. We have got to address it when they are born. We've got to provide resources to families. We have got to acknowledge and accept the fact that this is real and that it has not been by accident and that we have to begin undoing it in our policy making decisions. Well, that leads me to another question, I guess. <laughs> How would you undo it? What can we do to undo it? I've got a theory. Yeah. Would you like to hear? <laughs> <laughs> it's well, a fair if housing. you want to go first, what do you work. think? Oh. Fair housing. I think fair housing is absolutely a part of it. I think there are many pieces to it. I think, like anything, it's it's a very complex issue. But affordability and access to housing is huge. Affordability and access to transportation is huge. People being able to get from point A to point B, whether it's for their jobs or for child care, is a big deal. Uh, access to health care is a big deal. Um, making sure that we are providing those resources and those filling some of those gaps for families who do not have those opportunities right from the get-go, there are absolutely ways that we can start to reverse this. And I think we've seen in some innovative programming that has happened, especially when we're talking with zero to five, especially when we're talking about uh, addressing even mental health issues and behavioral health issues in young people, working on those things sooner and doing, you know, as we refer to it often, upstream work is absolutely what has to start to happen to reverse it. Thank you, Chip. I'm a little bit biased, but I think one of the reasons that I think this is the way that it is, but also one of the ways to fix it is that we need representation at all levels of our government to make sure that the voices who are in the community that reflect the values of the community are actually in positions of power as well. So the problem, oftentimes, when you don't have representation uh, in leadership, isn't so much that they don't care about you or your, or, or, or your community, it's that there's such a disconnect between your values and their values that they don't even know that these are important things. So first thing is, let's have people who actually are from the community 
uh, that represent the values of the community uh, be part of the decision making process and, and listen. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing as well is we have great advocates, some of them are in this room right now for the community, that I think have great ideas that themselves would probably be fantastic legislators. I'm looking at you, Aaron. Uh, and I want to make sure that uh, this community is, is able to get that voice as well. So the big thing for me is let's, let's put people who are in the community in positions of power so that we who are, are from here understand how we can fix this. That's one. Uh, the other one uh, we talked about, obviously, is fair housing. Uh, afford, uh, affordable housing is very important. There's Fox Cove, and this is not North Highland, this is Iberian. Fox Cove right now, folks haven't heard about it. Uh, developer from Bellevue just bought this building, and they're gonna displace about 35 families like in two weeks, and that's legal. And a lot of these families are, are very real possibility of becoming homeless. Uh, talk about trauma, talk about not being off in a good start. So affordable housing obviously an issue, it's an issue right now. Uh, education is important. Um, obviously not just access to quality education, but also making sure that the representation for the teachers themselves reflect the community. So uh, this is kind of a weird reference, but there's a movie called Crazy Rich Asians. <laughs> yes. right? So like, that was actually a big deal for me to see and for a lot of folks in the Asian community, uh, similar to Black Panther and whatnot, because that was the first time they saw themselves on the movie screen. Imagine if you had that every single day in your classroom. So what I think we need to do is making sure that we provide the resources for people from the community to be able to become teachers as well, to teach these kids. Uh, my wife happens to be a teacher in the, in the Highland School District at Shorewood. She's a special ed teacher there. Um, so those are some of the important things to me systemically and being able to fix uh, and undoing a lot of these things. But the biggest thing is listening to the folks who are already here and making sure that we're being culturally competent when we're actually implementing these solutions as well. Thank you. So uh, the Washington State Housing Finance Commission is responsible for financing low income and affordable housing in Washington State. The commission does not take demographics into account when approving financing. The underlying theme is that land is cheaper in North Highline, so it's financially responsible to build tax exempt low income housing here. Do you agree? I'll start with um, Jody Love, so Shannon. Uh, well, I think, I mean, I certainly agree that that has been happening. Do I agree that that is our best path? No. no I think that we are certainly seeing that it is, we, are not, we have not solved our affordable housing crisis in any way. We are simply putting it in, in specific communities sometimes and or really just not addressing it and for, continuing to force people out of our community. Not just the city of Seattle. We're seeing people move further and further south and or north and or, frankly, out of state. Uh, when I am out doorbelling, it is shocking to me the number of houses and the doors I knock on where people are actually saying, nope, I'm having to, I'm having to move. My property taxes are too high. Here are the things that are happening. And I can't afford to find another place in, in this community that I have lived in for so long. So I think that there are, I'm pleased that the state, um, when it comes to this issue, I'd be curious to review it and have an understanding of how we might be able to impact that at the state level and if there are things we can do to change and add in some other elements as they're making those decisions. Um, I also think that when it comes to the state funding of housing, you know, often when things are passed in the legislature, like there's a document recording fee to help with homelessness, they put parameters around that and some very specific uh, requirements about how that money can be used. And I would argue we really need to look at that and talk about trying to provide more flexibility and opportunity for that money because what works in one community for affordable housing may be different in another. The needs in White Center are different from the needs on Vashon Island. And can we come up with some solutions and some more flexibility in that kind of funding so communities can decide together how best to address some of these issues in partnership with their policymakers? So I do think there's some things that we can be doing to try to address that issue. Yeah, yeah so similar. Uh, obviously, I don't agree that it should just be based off of the land value because, uh, well, first off, I have the saying, price is only a factor of the absence of value. So to me, it's not so much what the cost of the land is, it's as much as the value that it can, can generate for that community. Uh, although, with the way that it's being handled now, one of the problems is that when you concentrate uh, these types of housing in only one area, oftentimes uh, low-income housing are the property tax exempt, which means that you don't actually have funding to provide the resources you need to support the people who are coming there in the first place. So um, part of affordable housing shouldn't just be the actual housing, it needs to be the infrastructure for other education, transportation, social services, to make sure that we're also supporting people who are then going to be there. So I think that should be part of it as well. Uh, in order to pay for this, uh, I think we need 
tax reform. So the root cause of a lot of these things, obviously there's a lot of people with good ideas that's going to cost money. I think tax reform is one of the most important things. Uh, Shannon mentioned that folks are being priced out of their homes. Senior citizens are being priced out of their homes. Oftentimes people say, well, yeah, my property tax is going up. But oftentimes most people don't own their actual homes. So just their rent themselves is going up. They have no equity in the house itself. So um, part of the solution would also be, you know, for now, uh, with issues going on, having tax credits for seniors so they can stay in their homes, having diversion uh, programs, like Marty was saying, uh, and make sure that we have a, a progressive tax reform that is able to actually fund these uh, initiatives as well. So what that means to me is uh, capital gains. What that also means to me is revisiting the tax exemptions that are on the books that don't get, uh, don't, don't expire. By the way, school levies, they expire for four years. Tax exemptions, they never expire. Uh, and then also uh, making sure that, uh, you know, we work towards a more equitable solution when it comes to funding for these services as well. And that just leads into another question that, I mean, there seems to be a pervasive attitude that people who spend a lot of money on their homes don't feel that they should live next door to low-income housing. And so housing gets concentrated in certain areas. So do you um, believe that people who live in affluent communities should not have low-income housing in their Yeah, no, I, so it's, it's funny because, um, first off, no, it, this should be all over Seattle, all over Washington State. Uh, in fact, we can use surplus lands in order to help provide some of these uh, affordable housing as well, which can be all over the place. Um, I don't think it's a negative thing to have diversity in your area, right? So a lot of these affluent places oftentimes are the least diverse. So I think they can benefit from having more folks uh, in the area that represent a diverse perspective. Uh, honestly, the best food is in White Center. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? Like, you go, you go to the crawfish house all the time. So imagine if you had uh, a breadth of diversity and then all these different communities coming together. I think that would make our communities better. I think that would make our country better, uh, if I'm honest, as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I support inclusionary zoning, and I also think that we're seeing... Thankfully, in this community, we're seeing some innovative things. So I don't know if you all have heard about the Block Project, um, which is a, a project for like building tiny homes for homeless people. And you actually, people in neighborhoods say, hey, you know, my house, you can put one of these in my yard. I've got room. And then they work with the block. They talk with their neighbors. They let them know what they're embarking on, and then they can have the home built there. It's, very, it's a very inexpensive way, but also a community-inclusive way to try to provide housing for homeless. It's obviously not a big population uh, solution, but it is a way to then introduce and to have communities be engaged and involved in the solutions as we're moving forward. So I think absolutely that those are the kinds of steps and the kinds of things that we need to be doing so that communities are all involved in addressing the issue that we have in front of us, the crisis. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna move on to an issue about gangs, which have been a problem in this area. So two girls, I'm sure you were aware, were killed in March. And then just recently, a tragedy, a 51-year-old grandmother was killed yeah. while she was at her desk at work. And that was just three weeks ago in Burien. Both were gang-related. Do you agree that gang activity is related to poverty and lack of opportunity? Do, who, um, and, and why, and then we'll follow that with why or why not, and what should be done? Uh, yes, I think without a doubt, um, and every every studies and all the data indicates that that is indeed the case. And one of well, there are several things we need to do. But one of the most important things we can do to start addressing gang violence is to really start working more with young people and to provide opportunities, real opportunities, outside of gangs for a sense of belonging, for a sense of accomplishment, for a sense of the ability to be in a community. And that can look a lot of different ways, and it doesn't work the same for every community. Again, this is a space where you must work very closely, be listening, be engaged with the people who are impacted by gangs, who are former gang members, uh, really starting to work with both parents and kids to try to address these issues much earlier in the process, and also to provide opportunity, because some of it, too, is economic. If there's not an opportunity for somebody to go and make money, they're going to go find one. Right? And gangs provide that opportunity in many ways. So I think also really trying to look at opportunities such as 
apprenticeships, making sure in our schools that we have options for kids to learn about trades, to learn about different ways to go and make money, that not everybody needs to go and get a four-year college education. There are a lot of ways to make good family living wage jobs, and that those are the kinds of things and the kinds of investments that we really need to be making to prevent people from uh, be getting involved with gangs in the first place. And we can't let up. I think part of the trick is what we've seen is we start to do this work, we start to work with gangs, we start to solve the problem, it lightens up a bit, and then we take our foot off the pedal and we think the problem is solved. And we need to continue and constantly be vigilant about this work and continue to care about our kids and about our communities and about our families all of the time, not just when we're having a gang crisis diverge. And then I think that's when we can start to edit. So I was at the Beard and City Council meeting a couple days ago, um, and we talked about uh, Fox Cove, so affordable housing issues. We talked about the gang violence, and we talked about gun control and gun regulations as well. Uh, what's interesting is that most folks came to talk about one specific issue, but they're all interconnected. Like it, It's very clear that if you're not given an opportunity to thrive and to succeed, if you're experiencing trauma, if you're not able to even have a place to go home that's safe, we're going to try to find a connection somewhere else. And unfortunately, sometimes that manifests in, in gang violence. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, Burien spends, I think, less than 1% on social services to help young kids and youths, yet they spend about 53% on law enforcement, right? So if you think about where the money is being spent, it's not really a surprise to me that we're spending more time policing people versus giving them the resources they need to actually succeed and to thrive. So part of the problem uh, is that we need to invest in our people, right? Uh, we need to have investments in restorative justice for folks who are already uh, going down the wrong path that we can bring them back. We need to make sure that we have opportunities for them to not have to go to that path in the first place. Uh, and everything from, uh, not just the way that we fund uh, the, the law enforcement, but, but, but funding for jails and funding for other things as well. We need to make sure that we're putting the emphasis on prevention and serving the community and making sure that they don't have to be in those positions in the first place versus waiting until after the fact. Uh, oftentimes the resources in the county and the state become siloed and oftentimes they're not working necessarily together. So what I mentioned before was that people think, oh, housing is different, gang violence is different, gun and education are different. They're all related. We need to together work uh, with our government to make sure that we're doing this in a way that's actually moving the needle for the community and not necessarily for individual programs. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We're gonna move on to marijuana. <laughs> so North Highline, with one of the highest property rates in King County, has six marijuana stores. All but one, um, well the latest, uh, all but one have been robbed. The latest one that opened hasn't been robbed yet. So five <laughs> have been robbed. Yeah. Three, so at, optimistic. Yeah, three at gunpoint, one of the clerks was shot, one was pistol whipped, one store several times, trucks drove through the front. So. Um, and the stores in Top Hat, particularly, have hindered economic growth in that area. Um, and according to business owners there, have actually hurt their businesses. We understand the state allotted 22 um, uh, licenses to King County <coughs> at large, with the expectation that the stores would be spread throughout the county, just as liquor stores were prior to privatization. That certainly has not been the case. And although the stores are concentrated in North Highland and Skyway, the benefit of the taxes collected have been dispersed throughout the county, not coming back to this community or Skyway. So do you think the concentration of marijuana stores here was done because the decision makers thought we needed pot in this community to cope with the lack of resources? <laughs> Officially crossed over into loaded questions. <laughs> for all communities, what happens then is when somebody makes a decision, you don't have somebody fighting on your behalf. 
Same thing happens with the budget. So in any budget, especially the Washington State budget, every single line item has a person that champions it, right? So if there's nobody championing your cause, it isn't as if you, you just don't get it because nobody even knows about your issues. I think that's kind of what's happening here is that a lot of it's being concentrated here is because uh, you need to have folks who can push back. Um, I think that's generally my response, but yeah, I mean, obviously there's, there's a detriment to the community. Uh, I know the Top Hat community very well. Some of my closest friends live there. That gas station right there, we always get snacks when we were younger. Not even there. So I know exactly where <laughs> we're talking about. Not after we go to the stores. Actually, first we go. But, uh, but that is actually convenient, now that I think about it. Um, but yeah, so obviously the concentration is not a positive thing. We need to make sure that we're doing it in an equitable way. Uh, I'm fine with the consumption. Obviously it's legal, but we need to do it in a way that's respectful and mindful of the community as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a public safety issue there that can easily be addressed. What about the money coming back to the area? Yeah, you know what's interesting with marijuana money is that it actually goes towards the general fund, so it becomes very difficult to track. So that's one thing that we need to do too, is making sure that we actually allocate it specifically for specific needs. Because right now it goes to a general fund. So all of those being generated and the impacts being felt here, it goes anywhere. So you're right, that's a problem. So I think, I mean, first I think we have to acknowledge this was, this was an initiative, right, that was passed, and frankly, it was clumsily implemented. I think there's no question. And I am concerned about some of the actions of the Liquor and Cannabis Board. We have the statewide, of course, the Liquor and Cannabis Board, and then we also have the, all the municipalities who are independently dealing with it. And there was and has been a great lack of clarity. Uh, as we were moving forward. And I think it's very clear that, especially initially what happened was this clustering happened especially in urban unincorporated areas. And so I do think we need to go back and address that. I think we absolutely need to address the revenue issue and uh, that revenues coming from pot, while it's a challenge to do because of how the budget is set up and you can't necessarily pinpoint everything, it's certainly not impossible. And we've certainly taken steps where when we see equity impacts on communities, trying to take things that we can use, things like what they're talking about with Initiative 1631, the carbon fee initiative, taking the revenues generated from that to put back into the communities that are most impacted. I think there is definitely an angle there that we could talk, work with, talk with colleagues at the state to try to figure out a way to identify some of that revenue using an equity and social justice lens based on what we are seeing related to, uh, to the pot issues. And then when it comes to public safety, again, as you know, I mean, I know the storefront deputies here are fantastic, but there are not enough deputies uh, throughout, throughout this region, and I think that is something, too, we need to pick up on and make sure, again, it's, it, I do really appreciate that in this community the deputies are a part of the community, um, that they're out not just when things are going down, but that they're actually known people in the community. I think that's important. I want to see more of that. Uh, to try to help address some of the safety issues. But yes, I think we absolutely are still fumbling through a bit the implementation of 502, and I want to make sure that at the state level where we need to do things to provide clarity or insist on the Liquor and Cannabis Board providing clarity that we do that. Okay. One caveat. So mm -hmm. the funding is tricky because uh, federally, marijuana is not legal. Right. If you've got, you got a state bank, we could probably fix some of those issues as well. Just putting it out there. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to move on. To, um, about affordable housing again and homelessness, but there's been a definite impact in North Highline because of Seattle's lack of affordable and low-income housing. People have been pushed to the edge of the city on the border of our community, living unsheltered in unhealthy conditions along Myers Way for over two years. It was finally cleaned up last week. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you feel the needs of unsheltered people can be best met? Uh, I think that's to me, right? Uh, so I was actually just at Arrowhead this afternoon as well and talking to residents there. And of course, the Myers uh, Place encampment came up as well and the issue of homelessness. As we all know, we are really facing a crisis in this community. And it's a crisis that has been building for many, many years. Um, I talked about, about, gosh, now it's been 10 or 12 years. I had a man sleeping in my carport at my house on a pretty regular basis because, come to find out, he was an al alcoholic, but he was vid visiting his mother at the uh, nursing home that was down the street from my house and then couldn't catch a bus back downtown all the time to get to where he slept, and that is why he would end up in my carport. And this was, you know, 10 or 12 years ago. And so we have seen that kind of thing. The population has grown so much, and we have an opioid crisis, and we have any number of other things that are causing more and more people to be unsheltered. 
I am a big proponent of having 24-7 shelters for people. Sometimes we need overnight crisis shelters, and it's better to get people under a roof than not, but frankly, to transition people out of homelessness, we need to provide more resources, we need to provide more opportunities, and a 24-7 shelter is the way we can do that. So what that means is they often refer to it as like a navigation center. And that is where you can have people come in, they can have their own lockers, they sleep in the same place in the evening, there are people on site to help them connect with either jobs or recovery or other social workers that might be able to direct them to other things that they need to help pull them back out of this crisis place that they are in. And so I am a big proponent of funding 24-7 uh, shelters. And I think uh, the states, I'm glad we protected the state's document recording fee, but it'll be coming up again in 2019. And that is a fee that helps to pay for homelessness services throughout the state. I want to be certain that we continue to protect that. And I also want us to look at uh, even more surplus lands. I'm pleased that the state started a review of surplus lands in this last session so that we don't have to sell everything at fair market value, but that we can look at it for affordable housing and or shelter in the first place. But, uh, for example, Washington State Department of Transportation is not one of the agencies that has to actually do a review of their surplus lands. I don't think that makes sense. I'd like us to address that as well. I think we are in a crisis and we need to be pulling out everything we can get to try to address that crisis, but I definitely believe 24-7 wraparound services are the best way to start. Yeah. yeah, we've had a homelessness crisis declared by the county and the city for a little while now. So the first thing I would do is if we had funding opportunity to put towards affordable housing, it should go towards affordable housing and not a stadium. Uh, that's one of the biggest things is making sure that we actually fund affordable housing so that we can do it. Um, and also, it's interesting, so the document reporting fee, so the Was Washington State has a housing trust fund that funds affordable housing for services. Uh, it's actually grossly underfunded right now. I think it, you, it's 2011 levels right now. So 28. 28, 28 levels. So it used to be about 200 million, now it's about 130. So we need to actually bring that back up to what it was before. So during the recession, it took money away. We never actually brought it back up. It's interesting, we also never brought back up funding for mental health and human services as well. So you take away funding for health and human services, funding for health care, funding for housing. Oh, we have a homelessness crisis? What a shock, right? So a lot of it is making sure that we're actually allocating money appropriately to the things that we already know we need. Like, this is not rocket science. Like, if we put funding towards people, if we put funding towards housing, we will be able to help people. So uh, what Marty talked about earlier with marriage place, diversion is actually a very specific uh, technique that works very well. It's three times cheaper to keep somebody housed than it is to take them out of homelessness. So diversion can be everything from what Marty mentioned, but even sometimes when you have a family, uh, the electrical might be dangerous, like even just making the house safe for kids, right? So one of, another thing that we could also do is making sure, so I'm, this is on top of my mind because of what's happening at Fox Cove, uh, the easiest way to keep, uh, the easiest way to get affordable housing is to keep the affordable housing. So oftentimes the older buildings, what happens is uh, they require maintenance and upkeep, but it's so expensive that the owners themselves then go and sell it, which then the new owners demolish it or renovate it, and then they increase the price. We can provide tax incentives or credits for current property owners to be able to fix up their property so it's two code and it's safe, uh, but also as long as they maintain a certain level of uh, the housing units that are actually affordable itself as well. So a lot of what we can do is try to alleviate some of those pressures. Um, uh, it's interesting, so uh, have anybody heard of like, All Homes KC? 10-year plan in homelessness. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I looked at their first study about 10 years ago because they actually did it at Stanford University. Their goal was to take away about, uh, to house 40,000 people. The interesting thing is they actually did it. The problem is they didn't expect the number of people coming into homelessness in the first place. So we need to be spending a lot more time and energy trying to keep people housed uh, so they don't become homeless in the first place. That way we can alleviate some of the pressures that we're seeing. So that way it's easier to serve the folks with navigation centers and, and through teams to get them off of the streets. Okay, thank you. Um, and that just leads to the um, tax for Safeco Field. What was your position? On so that? the first time we brought it up as a as a group of candidates, there was eleven of us at that point. Um, it was at the White Center Forum. I've always been against putting money towards the stadium. Uh, I'm unequivocal in terms of my position on that. Uh, in terms of making sure that that money should go to housing and what is necessary to make sure that people are housed. Uh, on top of that, I also make sure that we don't take corporate PAC money, especially from organizations that I think uh, would have been for that. So, uh, no, I'm against that, and I think it's a horrible idea, and it pisses me off when I see folks at Fox, uh, Fox Cove who are being kicked out of their homes right now 
uh, and could be saved if we were able to lend some sort of funding to, to associate with that. Uh, so I'm opposed to public fun financing of stadiums, mm -hmm. actually, in the first place. Um, in this case, though, this is a stadium that is owned by the Public Facilities District. So I could see that there is some basic maintenance that could be required. Frankly, what was sent over um, to the King County Council by the executive is not a package I would have supported had I been a King County Council member. Uh, I would have supported something much more like the Council Member Cole Wells uh, proposal, which was about... $20 million for maintenance over the life of the hotel motel taxes to provide basic maintenance, and then using the rest for the legislative intent that it was, which is uh, housing and tourism. And so uh, there is $160 million now going toward housing. I'm very pleased they got to that number. Um, and so I think that at least that part of it uh, I'm happy about. But no, I don't support public financing of stadiums just as a general note. Okay. And, um we're moving on to our last question, which is, although important, the state senate seat is a part-time position. What do you intend to do the rest of the year? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, um, I am a single working mom, and that's real. That's not just campaign shtick. So, uh, yeah, I have to have a job as, as well. And so I currently work at King County. I would not be able to keep the job that I have because it's too demanding of a job. Um, so I w am hopeful that I will be able to get another job within the county doing some sort of special project work or something that uh, I'll be able to maintain, you know, a lower salary at that job, obviously, but then um, be able to commit to this job as well. Because, again, as a, I think, you know, as we've talked about, it's hard to get, you have two candidates in front of you that represent people that are not often represented in elected bodies. And being a single working mom with school-age kids there is not one of those in the state Senate, and there's a reason. It's because it's a really challenging dynamic. Our body is set up on a really old system that is supposed to be for rich people and or independently wealthy people who can show up, you know, three months a year and do this job. We're still operating in that system. Maybe we can adjust that a bit at some point so that we can also actually get more people to be able to participate. But um, I think that it's um, pretty, it's, it's a great opportunity that we have. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a full-time job. You just get paid part-time. It's a lot of work uh, to be able to do it. One of the questions that the West Seattle blog asked in our interview was, why are you running now? And honestly, one of the main reasons is this is the first time in my life where I've only had one job. So I take care of my mom. I help my brother to school, my sister to school. Uh, I help them uh, as they were uh, growing up as well. And I'm not even the oldest. I'm the middle child. So... <laughs> And I got ignored as a kid. Um, so, no, so, uh, so the reason why I'm running for this and the reason why I'm fortunate enough to be able to run is that Microsoft, my employer, uh, actually has a civic leave benefit. So I can take time off to legislate and then go back to work as well. So I would still be, I'll still be a senior manager on my team at Worldwide Learning and being able to provide job training resources. i still be able to spend some time with my family and still be able to uh, uh, be engaged in the community as well. We're going to open it up to the audience, and I'll go through this list in order. Stephen Lampier, you indicated that you wanted to ask a question. I yeah, I have, I have a question, and it partly comes from someone who's been in business most of his life. So my question is about supporting small businesses. Yeah. I've been a small business owner for 42 years, most of my work life. One of the things that really annoys me is when politicians talk about that they want to help small businesses while they're campaigning. And that all disappears once they get elected into office. But that's not the only thing that disappears when they get elected into office, but it's one of them. So my question to both of you is whether you have experience running a small business, and if you do, what would you recommend that the government can do to help make small businesses more successful. Uh, Shannon, I think you're oh, I'll go no, first. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, actually, um, my family, when we first came to America, actually had a small business in White Center. It is no longer what it was before, and it is no longer an establishment that I would take my kids. So that makes any difference. <laughs> um, it was a billiards hall in White Center. So 
One of the biggest things that uh, I saw uh, in that experience was just the disproportionate amount of taxes that small businesses pay versus large businesses. I actually want to get rid of B&O taxes for small and medium-sized businesses uh, because they don't have the necessarily same access to tax exemptions and whatnot. Um, specific to this community, actually, so it's, it's very difficult for, um, I don't, so I've started a couple small businesses, including a couple in, in West Seattle as well, uh, for friends of mine that have helped them grow. One of the hardest things is uh, navigating that process. So getting your LLC, uh, getting your bank account set up in a way that is appropriate, making sure that you have the right accountants, do, doing all the logistical stuff. Uh, it's even more difficult if English is your second language. So serving the community here is making sure that we had an office or department that can actually help shepherd folks that may not necessarily speak English as their first language through that process as well. Um, and then also making sure that uh, uh, things that seem unrelated, but say for instance, uh, at least for us, uh, my sister has an engineering firm that she owns as well, so we see that. Um, healthcare costs are pretty important, so a lot of the things uh, that, that, that we care about uh, would also help small businesses by, if you can alleviate some of that burden, uh, you can make it a bit more cost effective to run your business as well. Um, and then, so in this area specific, sorry, I'm kind of rambling, uh, gentrify, gentrification is happening right now. We know that if you're a, a, a community of color, if you're a business that's owned by a person of color and, and you get displaced out, there is very, very, very good chance you'll never come back. So one of the things that we can also do is provide uh, support and funding for communities of color so they're able to maintain their business as well. Um, but even more specifically, uh, so I started a it's, a, it's a really random thing. It's a, he repairs custom car gate, like old car gauges. Um, he was very good at his job, just like a plumber would be very good at his job, just like a carpenter would be very good at his job. But he didn't know how to build a website, he didn't know how to do marketing, he didn't know how to do kind of the business development. So I helped him do a lot of that stuff as well. So if we're able to augment the good work that folks are doing now, so the skill sets that they're doing now, with some basic things like how do you build a website, how do you navigate these experiences, I think we can actually empower a lot of business owners to be very successful. Because oftentimes they're, they're good at what they do, it's the other stuff that kind of gets in the way. So I haven't run a small business myself, but growing up, my family actually had a couple of small businesses. Uh, my parents opened a restaurant that only lasted about a year, and my mother actually had a very successful business that was um, typesetting business. <laughs> so this was a while ago. Um, but it was a woman-owned and women-run business, and it actually did very well. And unfortunately, when the restaurant business failed, she had to sell that other business in order to make sure we didn't fall into bankruptcy, frankly. So um, my family navigated that time. She owned that business, I believe, for about six years. Um, and I certainly know the energy and the work that went into all of that and a lot of those administrative barriers um, that we've talked about. What I would commit to you, frankly, is this is a space where I think it would be important to have from the 34th district like a small business advisory committee of sorts that would be willing to come to talk to me about here's what we see at the state level that is impeding us at the local level, and here's some things that could incentivize small businesses. Because I think we talk a lot about incentives for large corporations, and we need to talk more about incentives for small businesses because they are so often the backbone of our communities. They really are economic, entrepreneurial opportunities for people that might not have opportunities in some of these bigger corporations. And I want to know about ways we can not only not make it hard to do, but actually incentivize people to be able to engage in small business. But I know I'm not the expert on that. And so what I would want to do is get a group of people around me who could help to come up with some strategies and some potential legislation and some things that we could actually do at the state level to try to make some change that would really help people here in the 34th. Thank you. Wendell, you're next. Oh, you guys pretty much answered some of it. <laughs> What I've noticed since I've lived here since 92 is I've, I've coached a lot of teams. I've addressed this with a lot of people here uh, from the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club, Salvation Army. And what I've noticed lately is, like the Boys and Girls Club, you might know, back in the day, it used to be just kids all over the place. Yeah. You know, they would feed them, give them some snacks, something to drink. You, it, it's not that way no more. Yep. You know, and we could talk about how, you know, we invest in those, you know, that's going to make it easier for us when they get older. So, is there anything that you guys can do? Because it's different from Fontenoy uh, YMCA compared to the Oh, sure. Stuff. 
Yeah. Well, and because I think the, the parents can't afford that. Mm -hmm. That boys and girls, mm -hmm. they don't get it. And the are. boxing club here is great too. I mean, yes, there are is. you know yes, there are some yes. great community resources actually for kids that I think we need to continue mm -hmm. to. And this is. This to me is one of those things where this is what it means to have community reach out, to reach into the communities and to actually understand, okay, what are the options and opportunities here and how can we help either reinforce those and or what is standing in the way of having those be successful to reach out to more families? Why are families not coming? You know, what is it about transportation? Is it about not knowing it's there? Is it about not having uh, culturally competent people on site who can help families who English is a second language? There's any number of things that I think we need to certainly be investing in. I mean, we see this at the county level, um, trying to work on things like youth and family sports grants and trying to find ways to actually, but you also then have to let communities know the grants are there and help them to apply and really provide a lot of resources and help there because you can't just put something out there and say it's available if you're not actually doing the legwork to show people how to participate, what they need to do, how they can be successful at it. And so I think that that is certainly something that we just all need to be continuing to try to work on, both at our local municipality levels, and then if the state can step up in some way to, to assist, whether it's with resources or other connections, I think obviously that's important. I went to the Boys and Girls Club down the street, so then that's why Wendell was mentioning that, because uh, I did benefit from having those summer programs. I would spend some, so we were on free lunch, so going there during the summertime was probably one of the only regular meals that I had growing up. Um, it, I benefited tremendously from that experience, uh, and, and I see the communities that are there now. Uh, the White Center CDA does a thing called White Center to White House, where they work with students to show them what civic engagement looks like and kind of guide them through that process as well. We need to be investing in our youths. We need to be investing in the community. We need to make sure that money is going towards the actual people. And that's what I'm saying before, is if we had funding, say, $135 million for a stadium, let's just put that towards that Boys and Girls Club. Let's put that towards the White Center CDA, right? So uh, there are certainly things that we can for sure do just to make sure that we're prioritizing our, our, ourselves and our society uh, in, in an appropriate way. But yeah, you're right. We need more money for youths. And I think, like, I, I have vivid memories of being able to play in that gym uh, with folks. There was this one kid that can dunk, and he was like 15 years old, just blew my mind. Uh, right? So, like, it, those are some life-changing experiences for me in White Center and being able to be part of that Boys and Girls Club. And I... And I I'm sad to see that it's not necessarily that, that way right now. Thank you. Okay, Bill Tracy. <clears throat> One of the issues that you're going to be dealing with in the legislature is kind of the lifeblood of local government. It's called the Public Works Trust Fund. We have been without funds were taken away back, I believe, in the 2014 session in order to balance the budget. Public trust fund monies are loans from the state to utility districts and to other uh, municipalities to do public works projects, such as sewer, water, uh, even libraries. We got something back this last, with the change of uh, the legislature this last session. But it was only a small amount. What happens with public trust fund, it is a loan. And it's a revolving loan. It goes back to the back to the government so it can be returned back. The problem was in 2014, they, were, they decided not to turn it back. So I want to get your impression what can you do to help guarantee that my sewer district, Glenna's Water District, can still apply to get public trust fund loans? For those of you that don't know it, these are loans that are issued at like one half to one percent, which allows us to not raise your property, your fees, not your property taxes. We don't do property taxes. Everything's on a fee basis. But if we have to raise the fees, now, Southwest Suburban, for example, is the second lowest in Western Washington of all rates. That's because of the Public Works Trust Fund. We want to see it maintained. How do you perceive that as your responsibility? I think you first, Jim. 
Yeah, same as you with the housing trust fund, right? Make sure they allocate the money effectively there. Uh, what we mentioned before is that money was cut. What's interesting, I keep bringing this back, but there's 680 tax exemptions on the books that never expire, yet when you do a budget cut, things like that get cut. Things like healthcare gets cut. Things like education or something, whatever gets cut. So making sure that you have a champion who's actually going to fight to make sure that that is, that is still going to be available to make sure that we're keeping the rates down for folks. Um, I honestly don't know the legislation well enough specifically for Public Works Trust Fund, uh, so I'd love to hear more from your perspective, but to me it seems pretty clear that if we fund it appropriately, we'd be able to maintain this ne the necessary need that we have for these organizations. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly want to meet with you in this particular sort of district, but I then think obviously it's building a coalition with the others as well, right? So I think it would be talking throughout the state about, okay, what's our common ask here? How do we make that happen? And then what do we do for this district in particular as the state senator to stand up and say, no, this is the thing that is most important for my community, so I need to make sure that's there. But I think it's going to obviously require not just not just the senator from the 34th, but actually a, a coalition of people. So I would want to meet with you and get a sense of who that coalition would be currently that are up to speed on this, and then who we would need to maybe navigate and try to get involved. So. Thank you. Well, here's the name that I'm not familiar with. John Rep? Yes. Yes. Hi. Hello. Yes. Would, would you join the Senate uh, Public Ranking Caucus? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. I guess that's it. Thank you for being short. <laughs> well, just a caveat. So we talked about funding a lot in these things, right? So right now, Washington spends about $2.3 billion every single year in interest costs that we send to Wall Street, specifically as U.S. Bank. Mm -hmm. $2.3 billion, right? So think about what that could be spent on in terms of the community, in terms of affordable housing, in terms of the Public Works Trust Fund as well. So having a public bank isn't just having the access to capital. We can actually reinvest some of those uh, those interest expenses back into the community for things uh, like, like Bill was saying. Okay, thank you. Another name that I don't know, Mary Mitchell. Oh, that's me. Hello. Hello. Hi, Mary. Um, I'm actually a newcomer to um, North Carolina. I bought a home there two years ago because it was affordable mm -hmm. at the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so having just experienced huge sticker shock at getting the reevaluation, yeah. um, you know, and I felt threatened by it. And I'm probably much better off than a lot of people in the district. And so when I really resonated when you said that when you're ringing doorbells, you're hearing people saying they have to move because of their property tax. Now, I've lived in other places where they actually have things called circuit breakers, so that they, if, if the tax goes up mm -hmm. over a certain amount, it's capped, and they have better you know, protection for seniors mm -hmm. and all kinds of things like that. And um, I did call the, the property tax people and had a very nice conversation, actually. Good. And so yes, I sir. said, what can I do? And they said, what you can do is you can try to get the legislature to <laughs> up the level at which you get a break. Right. right. Yeah. Yes. If you're a senior. But yes. I didn't talk about anybody else. So mm -hmm. I'm concerned for my neighbors as well as myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this is a huge issue. I think this is, I think tax reform is one of the number one things that we need to be working on. Again, as we've said earlier, the complexity of these issues often lies on what the revenue sources are. So I support a capital gains tax that would tax wealth have a homestead exemption that would not be impacting, you know, our fixed income communities, but rather our very, the very wealthy. And then I would want to use those revenues to bring down property tax and or sales tax. We've got our property and sales tax are on the backs of our working families and our low income communities. This, it is unacceptable that this state, this very progressive state in so many ways has the most regressive tax system in the nation. So, and I also think we really are, we need to do a better job at all of our municipalities, not to, just not just at the county, of sharing, making sure people are aware what exemptions are available to them right now, because not everyone takes advantage of it. And of course, the people who do take advantage are the ones who tend to have more money in the first place. So we've got to do a better job of advertising and talking about that and what that means. And at the county, for example, when we passed our Veterans, Seniors, and Human Services levy, we added seniors to that levy because it was clear from all of the community outreach that was happening that seniors are at risk of especially housing instability, health care, all of these issues, and that that was an issue that we felt the levy should address. 
but we also didn't want it to then add on to seniors' tax bills in a, in a bigger way as well. So we went to the state asking if we could have an exemption for this portion of that levy. That we've got to start changing, uh, increase what the exemption rate is. We've got to open up who can be exempted from it based on fixed income and how can and low income families and what measurement can we use. I think the state, there are, while I am a proponent of an income tax at the end of the day because it is the most progressive I, tax that we can have and more consistent until we get there I want to see us doing all of these other things that we can do looking at the corporate tax breaks making sure we are getting public benefit from those closing the ones that we are not addressing any revenue opportunities that we have through other angles and then frankly opening up and looking at things like property tax where those exemptions are how can we cap them what kind of homestead exemptions can we have and I, this is discussions that are happening, and I think that we can see some, some success here, hopefully, in this next legislative session. That's actually a very good point, and one of the reasons why, specifically in this district, we need to have a bold voice and a bold leader from the 34th. Uh, we actually missed the capital gains tax by one or two votes, some of you can probably correct me, this past session. And largely it's because you had a couple of moderate Democrats who were kind of wavering. So it's important for us to make sure that we have an equitable tax structure that is more progressive, which that does mean capital gains. That does mean revisiting the tax exemptions on the books for corporations, uh, some of whom were given tax exemptions for things that they didn't end up actually doing. Uh, for instance, a company that just laid off 6,000 people, made a huge profit, still gets $20 million in tax exemptions. Seems kind of crazy to me. Uh, so we need to have bold leaders in the state legislature who will actually work to convince the folks that are on the fence that this is an important issue that their constituents want. Again, what I'm saying is oftentimes representation doesn't necessarily reflect the values of the people in the community. And we need to have somebody there who is going to be dogged when it comes to making sure that they hear the voice of average folks. Uh, but yeah, so everything what we're saying is capital gains tax, uh, making sure that the exemptions uh, are increased. Uh, primary residents should also be exempt. Uh, but there's a whole host of things that we can do as well, right? So that's why I advocate for a state bank. I think it's going to be imperative for us uh, to harvest some of those gains as well. Uh, but that also means you need to lower, obviously, property taxes, lower sales taxes. I actually want to get rid of B&O taxes for small and medium-sized businesses, because I don't think it's necessary. Um, uh, but yeah, so those are some of the few things. And honestly, capital gains tax, uh, it affects a very small number of folks in Washington State. To give you context of how wide the spread is, there's four people who live in King County right now that are so wealthy, they can buy every single house in Seattle, every single one, in cash and still be billionaires, right? So, like, I just want to make sure everybody understands, <laughs> like, we can raise a lot of money without impacting very many people. Um, and they'll still be rich. Like, they'll be okay. Uh, but that's... And they yeah. support it, too. Yeah, and they actually support it. Yeah, you're right. So so good. Good. Yeah. to ask a question. Um, many of you know I worked at White Center Public Health for years and supported the WIC, uh, managed the WIC program there. And one of the things we worked on was, um, what? And family and planning. Family. But my question is more related to childhood nutrition. <laughs> so um, don't want to leave out family planning. Janet was a great staff member there in family planning. Um, so we know that WIC works to promote healthy childhood eating, works to combat childhood obesity. We know that sugary beverages are really a contributory factor to that. So I'd like to ask, I'm going to kind of ask each of you a separate question here. I'd like to ask about your decision to take half money from Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. who is promoting sugary beverages and only contributing to childhood obesity. And Joe, your thoughts about not taking half money. So I, uh, yes, I believe I got $750 from Coca-Cola, and I am opposed to the initiative 1634. I don't support the initiative, and, and I would not support the initiative, and I will openly talk about that and do openly talk about that. So accepting that money is not accepting any, and any more than I would assume that Joe supports every single thing that Microsoft does in a political environment. I certainly don't support every single thing that people who either donate to me and or even endorse me um, support. So even though you accept that funding. Right. I mean I don't I can't afford to self finance my campaign. And campaigns cost a lot of money, unfortunately. And I legit just cannot afford to do that. So um, I there's 
but that's not buying my vote. That's not buying me. As I just said, I openly, I do not endorse it. I do not support it. I do support campaign finance reform. I have always supported campaign finance reform. I have voted for initiatives. I have voted in honest elections. And while I appreciate the, value, if the choice to not accept corporate PAC money, I would also say Joe didn't even vote in the honest elections initiative. That's an action that we took to try to make voting more, more fair. I do think transparency is huge and important, and I would like to see Citizens United overturned, because I think where we have a huge issue is at the federal level, mm -hmm. where you have legit dark money coming into things and you don't know who's spending it. So I appreciate that uh, the initiative, I do not support Initiative 1634, which if some of you, you all aren't familiar with it, I'm sorry, they're referring to it as the Affordable Groceries Initiative. Mm -hmm. I think it's unbelievably misleading and not something that I support, and um, yeah. We don't take corporate PAC money because there's no ambiguity in terms of uh, our commitment and our loyalty to the people of this, of this district. Um, we also cannot self-finance. We're actually out fundraised two to one in the primary, and we still won. So uh, leadership is hard, and sometimes you have to make tough decisions. And for us, it was knowing that we were going to be outspent. So I, I don't fault anybody for doing what they need to do to win an election. For us and our values, I do not want to have anything compromised. Uh, uh, our, our, our conviction and our belief in this community as well. Thank you. Is Marlene Albright? No, she had to go pick some up at the airport. Janet Ray? Um, Rob, I'm sorry. You can take that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, yes, also. because I have noticed an increase in teenage pregnancy here in the White Center area. Mm -hmm. There are more and more teenagers walking around with big bellies. And at the clinic that we worked at down the street, which is now Mary's place, we were successful in bringing down the pregnancy rate here in Lake Center. Now that it has been given over to Planned Parenthood, it seems to be going up. I have met with three people who became pregnant because they were refused services at Planned Parenthood. And I would like to know how well you support a new clinic here in White Center area, White Center Bureau, led by King County. And then I have a specific question for Shannon, who is my voice. <laughs> <laughs> Would you want to answer that first oh, one first? I'll ask the second, second question after they're done. Is that me? Uh, I, I mean, public health is just a key to all of our communities, so I certainly support. I'm disappointed to hear that. I'd be curious to actually see numbers around the Planned Parenthood. That's disappointing to hear, and I would I certainly want to. Introduce you to three people. Yeah, yeah, no, I just would want to know more about that because I think we, def you know, it's it's about making sure we get the outcomes that we need. And so, if that is not happening, I think we absolutely have to readdress what our opportunities are to provide public health services in the community. No question. Yeah, public health uh, obviously is very important. It's important here. Um, it's interesting because this is similar to actually Vashon. Vashon has doesn't have a public uh, facility to have medical care uh, as, as robust as they need. Yeah, exactly. So we need more funding for that uh, in, in these types of areas that oftentimes see a lack of funding for services such as healthcare. So I completely agree. And I also would love to see and talk to the folks uh, who are running it now to see if there's a way that we can change the outcomes so they're they're more effective. Mm -hmm. I'm paranoid. They they refuse to see anybody with certain insurance. Yeah, okay. I love if you want to if you give me your contact, I love to follow up. Okay, Sarah. Oh, my second. Oh yeah. I received a flyer in the mail about three days before the primary election that came from your campaign, Shannon, and I was really upset by it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Did you okay that? Uh, actually, I didn't see the final, truth be told. And so this was a this was a situation where something was listed. There were sole endorsements. Usually on these things, you put endorsements or sole endorsements. And this said sole endorsements, and it actually listed two people who I was not sole endorsed by. One was the Washington State Nurses Association, and one was the Machinists. Mm -hmm. And the person who was working on the final added that word. She did not. That was a mistake that she made. It wasn't and just that. 
Oh, I'm not familiar with what other. That's the, that's the piece I'm familiar with. And so uh, we put out an apology right away as soon as we knew that that had happened, and we called those organizations and the candidates, and yeah, but that was a, that was a mistake. Were the statements that were being made that you were the only one that had any community service experience? What I don't think I quite said that, but I'm happy to talk it with you about really it and look at it if you would like. This is pretty clear. If you would yeah, like to look really at it. Clear that that's okay. what it meant. Okay. And I'm disappointed that you wouldn't be able to view it before it went out. I appreciate that. Thank you. It shows. So the reason why I keep bringing up Fox Cove because I just met with those families, and I'm a little bit upset, um, is because they don't have the same protections as you do in Seattle as well. So uh, yes to rent control, but also while we get there, we can work on strengthening the tenant rights so that way they can't be kicked out of their homes for literally no reason than profit motive. Um, so that's one of the things that I would probably work on as well as we get there. Keep up the good work. Thanks. And Martha, Martha, your turn. Yes, I'm assuming both of you are in favor of $15 hour minimum wage, right? Yes. yes. Right. Okay. Do either of you care to com com uh, comment on support from the Washington Hospitality Association, which has worked very, very hard against the $15 minimum, hour minimum wage? Mm -hmm. uh, I support the $15 an hour minimum wage, and I think, frankly, we need to talk about it probably being higher in regions that have higher costs of living. So. Uh, I support it. I also don't. I actually took that meeting with the Washington. This is kind of a funny story. It's on tape. Uh, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> so the Washington Housing Association fought against minimum wage and they fought against paid family leave. Hospitality. The Washington Hospitality Association. Um, I ended up taking that meeting with them because I wanted to talk to them in person about why they did that. Uh, and it was just a fascinating process because it's actually one of my first endorsement interviews. Uh, and, and I didn't want their money. I wanted to tell them to their face that they were wrong. 
Um, so it's interesting to me to see them fund other organizations and other campaigns. But yes, I support a minimum wage. Obviously, we don't take corporate PAC money, uh, so we wouldn't have taken their money. Uh, but I actually did meet with them, uh, and when they said, well, why should we support you in a very condescending way, in a very <laughs> condescending way, um, this is a camera right there, that's why I was going to <laughs> um, I said, I actually don't want your support. I wanted to talk to me in person about why you were against uh, minimum wage and why you were against paid family leave. Well, that's the last question we had for Okay, go. I didn't know there was a list, sorry. <laughs> go on. Uh, just one quick question, I don't know what's going to be. Position on annexation. As you know, this area is ever since I've lived here, since 1998, it's been a question almost all those years. What is your stance, both of you, on annexation and when it should occur and how we get there? And are you in favor of Seattle? Favor in or favor some other option. So I think both of us are going to say very similar things. Although I will give you an actual uh, stance. Uh, at the end of the day, the people here should decide uh, where they go, kind of how that looks. Personally, I actually favor going towards Seattle because I think the services that they can provide uh, will be beneficial for this community. However, the biggest downside for that is you're going to see rapid gentrification, and you're going to see wait. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, you're going to see rapid gentrification, you're going to see displacement uh, happening very, very quickly. One of the biggest things that the state legislature can do is actually provide a sales tax credit, so that way you can reduce the, the burden on the community here. Although we need to have more services and funding for services to make sure that we don't displace communities of color, and we don't displace businesses of color as well. So it's going to be a very tough issue. Uh, I think, uh, again, the people that are here should decide where that goes, uh, and those are my stances, because I do know that something is going to have to happen, but at the same time, uh, my family still lives here, and they're going to have a hard time staying here if the prices go up any higher, if the taxes go up any higher as well. Yeah, I think we absolutely, there is a sales tax credit in place for the potential annexation area. We have to continue to protect it because it's constantly, people are trying to take it away as an, as an option. So um, Seattle, as I understand it, is continuing to move forward with the potential annexation. It is absolutely up to the community. Communities vote on it. I do believe the unincorporated uh, King County is not providing, is not able to provide the appropriate level of services at this time. We're certainly working to try to do the best that they can do at the county um, and are, uh, have a new Department of Local Services and a department director who is here. And uh, I think, you know, we need to continue to do the best that we can do with the unincorporated services that are here, but I would support a vote on annexation by the community, um, by the city of Seattle. To clarify, Seattle would be right. Or, uh, Seattle. Okay. But, but, well, I think Burien, if Burien steps, I mean, I think if that's, I do believe it's up to the community, and the community yeah. votes on these things. Right now, Seattle is the one making the progress and making some steps and actually looking at it. So that's what's on the table right now. But I don't think that that necessarily has to be the only option. If Burien, Burien were able to step up and we were able to have this conversation on that direction, I think it's a good conversation to have. And that's, I'd love to hear more. It's up to the community. So I've, I was actually sitting here since 1983, so this is a conversation that I've been having for... 72. Oh, dang, you beat me. <laughs> you beat me. So it's, uh, it's difficult. I think there's a lot of moving parts that need to be figured out still. So I'd love to hear more from the community. Honestly, I think it's the community's option, it's the community's choice. So all the information that you have on my flyer, that's my personal cell phone, that's my personal email, that's the same one my wife uses. Uh, feel free to give me a call. Uh, and I will answer, and I will listen as much as I can. Yeah. You, Bridget? Got one more question. Okay. So I come from a military family. Yeah. And um, I do work for the industry and we're from Burien Nursing and Rehab. And a lot of the folks, well, not a lot, but there are quite a few folks that come to us that are veterans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do you plan to do for our veterans who have paved the path for us to be here today? And her husband's been. And her husband's been. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, my father was a Vietnam vet. Vietnam vet. Um, my father-in-law is a Navy SEAL. His father was actually the first class of Navy SEALs that fought in the Vietnam War as well. So strong military family on our side, and uh, there's certainly a lot of respect. And thank you for your service. Thank you for all that you've done for our community. Uh, we need to do everything that we can. Uh, I know the county has done some stuff in terms of 
making sure that we're providing opportunities and resources for veterans uh, as a whole. Uh, one of the biggest problems, so I, uh, there's a, there's a, the VA is not in the district, but there's a lot of people in this district that go to the VA. There's a whole host of things that I've heard from folks in the community. And that's Sean, actually. There's a couple of vets in Dashon that are very passionate about this. We will have to go all the way over to the, the VA in Beacon Hill. Uh, I think there needs to be more funding, and there also needs to be a better process to make sure that they can go through the intake process to, to get the health care that they need. Um, there's a lot of things, but that's something that comes up over and over again, is getting the access to health care that they need through the VA in a way that is actually easy. I don't know how else you would call it. It's a very cumbersome process, as you, as you probably know. So I would be working towards a solution to making sure that getting access to the care that you need is not as hard as, as it is right now. Yeah, my dad was also a, a Vietnam vet and used ROTC to get through school. And uh, obviously, the commitment that our veterans make is the ultimate commitment that they can make for our community. So I think we need to continue to do everything that we can. And I'm really proud of the work that's been done at the county uh, on the Veteran Seniors and Human Services Levy to help provide resources where there's a gap with our state funding and or with our federal funding. I do think at the state, we really should start also trying to figure out ways that we can actually help to manage some of those federal dollars better as the pass through and things that we might be able to do to step up to streamline some of that work. And I am definitely interested in trying to address those issues. I think there, there are many things related to the VA that are a part of it, but there are also a wide variety of veterans issues that I would want us to be certain that we were leveraging every dollar that we could for our communities when it comes to what might be available from the federal government and being sure that we were investing in the ways that was getting the outcome that our communities were looking for. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. One more yeah. way she hasn't gone behind you. Really yes. I think she hasn't had oh, much <laughs> yeah, I just had one. Um, I just had one question. I've worked in um, sexual health and sexual violence prevention for about 20 years now, and I know Shannon and I have heard that you had interest in introducing a bill related to consent education. Mm -hmm. And I did. I wanted to say there have been several bills that have passed right. in the last few years related to mm -hmm. sexual assault prevention education, child sexual abuse mm -hmm. prevention. It has been, I think. Um, when you look at it clearly, it has been sort of a strange, piecemeal, burdensome sort of approach to this mm -hmm. issue that hasn't, um, that's been difficult to implement and hasn't really helped, I think, to end the problem of sexual violence mm -hmm. at all. But I do wonder if either of you have anything to say about what role you could play in this position. Mm -hmm. Well, I was interested to learn that um, for our sex education courses in this state, there is the only one that is required by the state uh, as a whole it, with, with our public education is related to HIV and AIDS prevention. And then school districts make a decision about what they do as far as sex education goes. And there are certain parameters that they need to follow, medically accurate and all of these things. Frankly, I think things like consent and what I have seen, of course, in this past couple of weeks that we've seen at the federal level and the reactions that we've seen at all levels, actually, the state level as well, a lot of situations that have come up have really been infuriating to me as a woman, as a mom, um, and I believe we need to do better by providing those that kind of education within our public schools, and frankly before that, um, but I believe in our public schools we could actually talk about consent education, not just being a part of the sex education program, but being a part of the health, uh, you know, health program that's in schools outside of sex education, if that's what we need to do to require it in all of our public schools. And so I do think there's some options there. Obviously, a lot of people work on this kind of thing, ERW, other legislators. I think we need to come together and figure out what the most impactful thing we could do it, that we could do statewide, that absolutely would be a requirement statewide. Yeah, so I agree uh, with all of that, making sure that we have the funding implementation that is not so disjointed. Uh, I'd go a step further as well, so making sure that if something were to happen, uh, we had workplace requirements and rules that punish the folks who are committing these acts, and make sure that even in uh, law enforcement, they have a whole backlog of rick kits that have not been gone through, thousands. So not only do we need to work on the prevention, we obviously have a problem right now on the actual assaults themselves, and making sure we take care of those as well. Thank you for your question. Thank you, everyone. I will, well, real quick, Martha. Just one quick. Regarding annexation, will both of you commit to requiring a vote by the inhabitants of the area? Oh, 100%. Of course. 100%. Yes. 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 Please don't go anywhere yet. I want 